Welcome to the session, Shattering Ceilings, The Bold Ascent of Two Black Women into Leadership. Our speakers today are Dr. Sherilyn Harrison, President and CEO at Public Research and Evaluation Services, and Lichia Cushman, CEO at Family Rising and the Center for Workforce Equity and Leadership. Get ready to be inspired. Thank you for the opportunity to have a very important conversation about Black women, leadership, and child welfare. This is important because Black women are disproportionately involved in the child welfare system, both because they have a higher likelihood while pregnant of being screened for drug use, and they are also more likely to be reported to child welfare once their children are born. Furthermore, it's well documented that Black children are disproportionately represented in foster care. In most recent data, Black children make up 15% of the child population, but 22% of all kids in foster care. Given this situation, we need leaders who are Black and women to transform this system. If we are concerned about disproportionality, we have to put leaders in place who know and are sensitive and look like the families that are overrepresented in child welfare. To set the context of our discussion, Lihia and I are going to give you an overview of what Black women experience in the workforce. That will be followed by a description of who is in the workforce. That is, what are the life experiences of women in the workforce, those who come to work every day? And we are here to be transparent with you and to share our personal stories about the challenges and successes we have had as leaders in the child welfare space. We will close with a call to action to both the system and what we as Black women can do to stay healthy, strong, and effective as we continue to prepare to take the call of leadership. Thank you, Charlene. As Charlene mentioned, um, the first part of our conversation today is really going to be focused on sharing some data. I am a huge fan of data uh, because I believe it tells a story. And I, I think we would do a disservice to all of you if we didn't start with the data to then connect it to the stories that we're going to share with you today. In a recent Forbes article, um, I was uh, informed of the following. Only 4.4% of Black women hold management roles. Of those 4.4%, only 1.4% are in C-suite management roles. Up to 54% of Black African women significantly change their speech, their clothes, their hairstyles to enter and be in the workforce. I myself um, have experienced that as well. Charlene, um, do you, do you have moments where you remember having to adjust how you approach something or how you stepped into a room um, as you were growing in your professional career? Absolutely. Uh, I have the story of staying up all night uh, for something that was due. I was the only uh, Black woman on a team of leaders, and we had an assignment, and I stayed up all night to complete the assignment only to find that everyone else on the team had used their privilege without discussing it with the head manager and, and decided that they would do it later. So absolutely. Yeah, I've, spe I've, I've been in those spaces as well. Additionally, um, the Forbes article also pointed out that 54% of Black women are often the only person of their race in rooms feeling extra scrutiny. And I can tell you for myself, um, I often, if you've heard me speak before, you'll hear me say a lot that the the role that I've stepped into, the rooms that I have stepped into in child welfare were not necessarily created with me in mind as a leader. And so oftentimes I find myself feeling like the only one of something um, in a space that is dominated by, by white culture. And again, we're gonna continue this conversation um, focusing on Black women in the United States. The Forbes, Forbes article also pointed out that 26% of Black women hear surprise comments about their language skills, abilities, versus 11% of white women. I personally can relate to this. I have had supervisors not only rewrite 
something I have written um, with red ink <laughs> many times. Um, but I've also had um, people also tell me how eloquent I am um, for a daughter of immigrants or for a Black girl from the Bronx. And so uh, I step into that space often and often find myself having to remind people that um, bringing your whole self to work matters, right? And that it shows up in different ways. 40% of Black women say they need to provide more evidence of competence versus 28% of white women. Charlene, I think you had a really great example um, to speak to this to this data point. Absolutely. Uh, in instances where my research was often scrutinized, I mean, what do you think a Black woman owning a research com company and not being your typical white male with glasses and a beard. And so often when I would suggest something in a meeting of a team where I was the only one, I would be required to write up my suggestion. Everybody else could openly and verbally suggest in the room, but I was asked to, to write mine up and bring it to the next meeting so that I, again, could show more evidence of competence than anyone else on the team. Point number six, in a 2022 report, it found that 43% of Black Caribbean women and 41% of East Asian women felt uncomfortable in their workplace cultures. A big part of that has to do with, are we the one of one thing? Are, are we able to bring our full authentic self to work? Or is it something deeper? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And Charlene, I'm going to pass back on to you. Thank you. And I wanted to make a remark about being the only person of race in the room. I had one instance when I was attending a university directors meeting in San Antonio, San Antonio, Texas, really excited about being there. And I was approached by one of the organizers to make sure I was legal as I sought to get a pastry and tea at seven o'clock in the morning. I was told, excuse me, this breakfast is for directors, to which I replied, I am a director. Needless to say, the person during the meeting spent many hours looking at me and apologizing. But again, just because they saw a Black woman suited up, even though it was 7 a.m. in the morning. Who would get up to steal a pastry? I don't know. But uh, I was told that, uh, again, I was, they wondered if I should have been there. Did I, was I supposed to be in that space? One other thing I wanted to look at, or we wanted to look at in this was, who are the women that are showing up at work? And we see that 47% of Black women have never been married. And uh, that's compared to 21% of white women. And why is that important? Because research shows that 87% of women still want to be married uh, before having children. And that's despite premarital sex and cohabitation being the norm. We also see in the research that Black women are the head of 27% of Black families. They're the head of household. And they also have a higher prevalence of chronic health conditions, including heart disease, stroke, cancers, diabetes, maternal morbidities, obesity, and stress. And so all of these things confront, confront us, yet we are thought to be and should be strong Black women, strong all the time, no matter what is impacting our lives. This myth is actually a well-researched phenomena called the Strong Black Woman Schema, or S. BW. It has been written that the emergence of this schema can be attributed to slavery, slavery, excuse me, when we were labeled as physically and psychologically stronger. An example of that is Dr. James Marion Sims, the father of mon modern gynecology. Beginning in 1844, Sims repeatedly performed his experiments on enslaved women in Alabama without any form of anesthesia. Can you imagine that? And this idea that we are physically and psychologically stronger justified the inhuman treatment by those in charge of our enslavement. In other words, you could kill our husbands you can take our children. And it was believed that we could take it. So what do we do as mothers? We teach our girls to be strong, to prepare them for the brutal and violent life of slavery 
mothers taught their girls to be strong so that they could survive on the plantation. And then what happened after enslavement? Research has consistently documented the continued impacts of systematic oppression, bias, and unequal treatment of Black women. Substantial evidence shows that there are racial differences in socioeconomic outcomes, such as education, employment, and housing that are attributed to discrimination and historical laws that are developed to oppress Black women in the United States. Lahia, what do you think about all of that? It's heavy. Um, I think about even going to the doctor and telling the doctor, I remember going and telling the doctor that I had a, a this chronic pain on the left side. Um, and he told me, come on, you're strong, you can do it. And so it reminds me that even in spaces like getting medical attention, our, our ability to um, be vulnerable feels really far away, really um, out of our reach at times. And so um, you're the one, Sharon, who taught me about this um, strong Black woman schema. And I think it speaks to all the things that I've encountered, um, not just professionally, but throughout my life um, as a woman of color. So uh, definitely it makes sense to me that it it started out in slavery and enslavement for sure. Yes, yes. And then some other things that we're confronted with. And thank you for sharing that, because I think there's a lot of research that shows that we don't get the same treatment um, um, in the medical field. And again, it's showing up with these high rates of uh, morbidity that's occurring with Black mothers, uh, uh, women when they're having uh, children. Um, and they're seeing that, you know, they don't believe us when we say we're in pain. Uh, we also know that large percentages of Black households are headed by single moms. And with Black men being incarcerated at a high rate, many Black women are forced to assume the roles of financial provider, caregiver, and community agent. That is the one who takes care of business and makes connections in the community. So we really wanted to let you know, and anyone that is working with Black women, who's coming into the space? Who's coming to work every day. But there is some research that some African-American and Black women perceive the schema as empowering. There are some who perceive the schema as contributing to a positive self-image and showing that we have strong survival skills. But Black femi feminist scholars don't agree. Instead, they characterize it as a controlling image that justifies our mistreatment, marginalization, and limits our ability to become healthy and has a positive sense of self. Others theorize that it's a stereotype that makes Black women responsible for how they are treated, like I said, while covering up structural institutions that enable racial inequality. But it's theorized that this schema acts as a facade to mask our internal struggles of depression and anxiety. And there's a lot of research that shows as we're self-silencing and not talking about the struggle of having to be strong, that we actually definitely end up with depression and anxiety. And again, there's a lot of research supporting that. Lydia? Thank you for sharing that. And as Sharon mentioned at the beginning of this talk, this conversation, we're going to share some of our stories with you. I have two in particular that stand out to me. Um, the first is when I, uh, when it was announced that I was the new CEO for what was then called the North American Council on Adoptable Children, um, now Families Rising. One of um, one CEO of another organization, a white male who had been working in child welfare for most of his career successfully. Um, scheduled a call with me. He wanted to meet the new CEO and really um, spend some time connecting. At least that's what I thought. Uh, but when he got on the call, one of the things that he reiterated over and over again was how lucky I was that I got chosen to be the CEO of this organization. And he went on and on about the great shoes I need to fill. 
So he was really feeling me out, like, who are you? We don't know who you are. And I'm sure that the way that I look also impacts the way that people, um, some people had to digest this, this change in leadership. And I remember, you know, some people will call that a microaggression. For people of color, at least for myself, it, there's very, very rarely a time when I experience a microaggression that it feels micro to me. Mm-hmm. It's something that lingers, that really lasts a long time in my mind, in my body, my soul. And I carry that with me to the next meeting and then to the next meeting. And so I would encourage folks, if you see people of color stepping into roles that you didn't expect a person of color would step into, that you congratulate them on their merit alone, not necessarily how lucky and fortunate we are. I'm the daughter of immigrants from the Dominican Republic. I grew up on food stamps. I um, had to um, go to college and and hopefully get an academic scholarship. There's a lot of pieces of my story that I am never going to be ashamed of, but I do think it's important for, for people to understand that there's nothing lucky about the fact that I got to, um, I was selected to be the CEO. It took a lot of work. It took 25 years of um, working in child welfare. It took a lot of lived experience. And so for me, that was one of those moments where I was like, oh, even here, right? You think you made it to like this pinnacle, right? Even here, people have a hard time with how I'm showing up. Secondly, the second story I'd like to share is goes back 20 years. And while I was um, at a conference recently, I shared this story as well, because even 20 years later, it still tells a story. So I was an adoption social worker working at a county level position. I had been there for two and a half years. I was hired because um, in um, child welfare during that time, there was a 10% increase in um Latinos entering our community. And so during that time, our organization felt like it was really important to hire people that look like the families we're serving and that also speak the language. And so as an Afro-Latina, my first language is Spanish. I had been hired to be part of this adoption unit and really do some big work with families. While sitting in an all-staff meeting, a coworker got a brilliant idea And she shared that she thought we needed to hire more, not more, we needed to hire a a Spanish speaking employee to work with Spanish families. And the whole room kind of shifted and looked at, looked at me like, is she joking? And I explained to her, I was like, Hey, I've been here for two years. We've been doing this work together. I'm working with all the family, all the Spanish speaking families. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you feel like there's an additional need? But she wasn't talking about in addition to me. Her response to me was, oh, you're just black to me. And in that statement, so many things that were a challenge to me. One is this is a white woman working in predominantly black and brown communities. And to put the word just in front of black was really hard for me to digest. And again, I'm going back to this point on microaggressions. Microaggression that was considered a microaggression felt really aggressive to me because you're not only eradicating a whole part of me, which is daughter of immigrants from the Dominican Republic. I identify as Afro-Latina. It was a problem, right? But it was also a problem because if this is how she was talking to me, how was she addressing families that didn't look like her? And so I say these really painful, hard stories because I think for those of you who are women of color working your way through this system, through this um, profession, know that it doesn't really, no matter what level you hit, you're going to face some of this. Um, but I also think that there is hope in how we respond and how we address these uh, microaggressions moving forward. But I know, Sherilyn, you have some fantastic, deep stories to share as well. So I will pass it on to you. Yeah, thanks. And thank you for sharing. I I really uh, remember you telling that story and it really highlights just uh, a misunderstanding about what is right to say and what shouldn't be said and and the invisibility uh, that people are comfortable with you being invisible. You know, Um, for me, I uh, was told uh, I'm really assertive 
but I was told that I was too aggressive. Um, I was told that I am, am too outspoken, that I come across like an angry Black woman. Uh, but instead, I was just really participating, not angry, but again, being assertive. Um, I was also told one time uh, when someone was trying to give me advice to act like I don't know what um, what's going on. And I was like, well, why would I do that? Because that's not my genuine self. And, and that I want to be genuine in all spaces that I'm in. And I want to feel uh, that I can be genuine in all spaces that I'm in. Uh, and just really going back to the whole idea of my need to write whenever I had a suggestion or my work not being valued. It talks about something called epistemic exclusion. And what is, it, what is a way of marginalizing faculty of color, it's looked at in academia, when their beliefs and their, uh, just, I'm sorry, not their beliefs, but their work is seen as not being of value. And so we are published as much or our work is scrutinized to a greater extent. And so um, I just see that those are things that we as leaders uh, are confronted with. And you just have to um, go back and, and not allow the recognize those things, but not let them impact your journey. Because if you're called to be a leader, you're going to run into those issues. I remember once when I was leading a union and I felt so I had a wonderful mentor and I felt so bad because I had developed this program. It was doing really well, but people were talking ill of me. And um, Mary Steele was her name. She told me when you come out in front like that and as you grow, people are going to talk about you because now you're visible to them as well. So they're going to try to figure out ways to make you, to, to break you down. And that has always stayed with me where now, you know, people can just about say anything about me and I can roll over and go to sleep at night. But definitely that's something I think that we as women of color, as we're pushing through this system and seeking to shatter the, the ceilings that uh, it occurs to us much, much more than, than, other, than other people. Doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Thank you for sharing that. So as we're talking about our leadership experiences, you heard Sherilyn mention um, that many people thought she was ill-informed or they told her she was too aggressive or outspoken. She felt excluded. I, um, You'll hear me talk about being a transformational leader in a very transactional system, um, how I felt isolated and oftentimes still do, and how imposter syndrome plays a role in how I lead and how I think about myself sometimes. Um, and it's a constant daily struggle to uh, find, find that there's value in what I have to give in a space that is continuously criticizing the work that I've done and the work that I have yet to do. And so a lot of you are thinking, so what can I start doing right now? First, I would encourage any program manager, director, CEO, be transparent about pay and benefits. Ensure Black women are paid fairly and receive the full budgeted compensation for their roles without lowballing offers. That's hard, but it can be done. And I, I can tell you proudly that I've been able to do that within my own organization. And it feels good to make sure that everyone's being compensated fairly. Second, I would recommend is understand what lack of privilege looks like at work. We often talk about what um, privilege is, but we never talk about the experience, or very rarely do we talk about the experiences that Black women experience when they have a lack of privilege in the workforce. And I can tell you some of the things to look out for. Who's sitting at the top making decisions? Who reports to the people at the top making decisions and just keep going down and down and down the organizational chart. That is one clear way to see, are people of color mentored in this organization? Are they encouraged? Are they supported? And are they promoted? Secondly, we are, you know, we are going through a huge transition within this country where everything's politicized, right? Equity is politicized. Um, belonging is politicized. And so, uh, for my organization, 
We fund DEIB efforts. We will continue to fund DEIB efforts within the organization and externally as well, primarily because um, without those conversations, those really in detail conversations about why things need to change, until that happens and until we put it put action behind it, it's not going to go away. So having one DEIB the DEIB training is not going to change your organization, but it's the ongoing conversations that really, and, and actions that lead to transformational change. And then mentorship. Are we mentoring just at the surface level? Is there a real intention to not only mentor um, those that look like you, but black and brown in, um, individuals within the workforce that don't look like you? How do you carve out time to not just tell them what they're doing wrong? Because that's not mentorship. Mentorship is, I believe in you. I believe in your shine. I will not tell you ever to make yourself small, but I will coach you. And so mentorship for me didn't come until 2019. And I say that simply because um, after 2019 is when I was recognized nationally, where I got opportunities to work at Adopt US Kids and sub subsequently applied for this CEO role. And I say all that because I think it's important for people to understand mentorship can change someone's life mm -hmm. and the trajectory of their career. And when we're talking about call to action, I just want to make sure that employers and um, supervisors are ensuring that their staff can be their authentic self in the workforce. One of the things that has changed in the workforce since the pandemic is people want to be who they are. They want to show up as they are. And we need to, in child welfare, we need to make space for that. We don't necessarily do it for the kids we're serving. We don't necessarily do it for the families that we're serving. And we definitely don't make space like that for the, um, the staff that work for us. So make the space, and and I want to be clear, allowing for people to come as their authentic selves means that things may get a little messy before they get clear, and that's okay too. Um, mentor, so let me go on to the next point, is mentor beyond surface level, and I kind of already touched on that, the importance of really getting to know who your employee is, who, who you're um, supervising, and then coach them into where you um, believe that they can be. So I always say to my staff, I want you to be in the right seat. And so there has been a lot of restructuring, but I believe in people being in the right seats and that they can lead um, differently and, and more empowered if they are in those spaces. And again, fund your DEIB efforts. But here's the point I want to make here. Please make sure that as you are continuing your DEIB efforts, that you're not only putting that one black or brown employee in charge of this work. This work is hard, it's complex. Um, for those of, for people of color, it is emotionally difficult. And so really be mindful about how you're continuing this work moving forward and how you're making space for your staff to debrief, unpack the painful parts of um, DEIB efforts. And then when a person, when a, a staff member of color, when a professional of color tells you that this microaggression or this difficult thing they experience, this racist um, experience happened to them at work, listen and believe them. And that's, you know, when we're talking about allyship, right? We talk about this all the time nowadays as a key term, and I'm an ally, and we're putting stickers on our doors, or we're making sure that everybody knows that. True allyship requires going beyond performative actions. I'm going to repeat that one more time. True allyship requires going beyond performative actions. It means speaking up for Black women. It means listening and being willing to risk your own comfort and reputation for that person's voice to be heard. If that is who you are, then we welcome it. But allyship will require some sacrifices. And so I just wanted to put that out there and make sure that we're all on the same page on what that means. And uh, I want to continue that in the call for Black women. So Lichia really told us what the people in charge need to do to make sure that they're supporting 
Black women in the workforce. And I want to challenge us as Black women to know what we have to do. First of all, we've got to acknowledge the helps and the hurts. There are allies that know how to support you. There are a lot that don't have a clue and they call themselves allies. But when that doesn't exist, we need to speak up and tell them. I know sometimes it can be scary, worried about your job or your position. But really, when you think about the moral injury that you may um, that may uh, you may experience if you aren't telling people about what uh, is being done to you or how it makes you feel, you don't feel psychologically safe. You need to speak speak up in those spaces where that doesn't happen. And I just recently had that happen where. Uh, and it has happened before, I should say, where people wanted to blame me for something. And I'll speak up immediately and say, it, I'm not going to carry the blame for this whole thing that's going on uh, or what didn't go right in this organization. I was even told one time, well, someone's got to fall on the sword. And I said, well, it won't be me because there are a lot of things that happened that didn't make us make this timeline or made, you know, where we made this mistake. So. Uh, so be, so speak up. I want to make sure that women know to speak up. Also, avoid maladaptive perfectionism. This is unhealthy setting of unrealistic standards, which combined can make you feel have harsh self-criticism and low self-esteem. Everything is not a priority. And so I released myself from that and I told before about, I had a meeting and, and two or three people was like, this is due tomorrow, it's a priority. And, and they were all within the same organization. And I told all three of them, all three of these cannot be priorities. So let's meet together and decide what is a priority. Remember that story I told about staying up all night thinking that I had to do it? That was to me an example of me wanting to be the perfectionist and, know, and finding out that that I, you know, I was up to most of the night and had to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning, probably didn't get but two hours of sleep. Now who I am, I'm firm about self-care. I want to live, love, laugh, sleep, exercise, hydrate, read, travel, dance, walk, whatever I want to do. I make sure that I make time to take care of myself. The work that we are doing in child welfare, and particularly those that are on the front line working in child welfare, it requires that you care for yourself. And the whole thing about, I'll go back to the strong Black woman uh, syndrome. There's a quote scheme, I'm sorry, strong Black woman schema. There's a quote that says, it's a mantra for so much a part of U.S. culture that it is seldom realized how great a toll it has taken on the emotional well-being of the Black African-American woman. As much as it may give her the illusion of control, it keeps her from identifying what she needs and reaching out for help. Go ahead and reach out for help. It doesn't make you weak. It's okay to cry when you're frustrated. Crying is good for you. And so I just want to make sure that you know to take care of yourself. Again, be firm about your self-care. And then you are the nurturer, but don't forget to be nurtured. It's it, to be nurtured. It's very, very important that you create space and create relationships that allow you to also be nurtured as you're on your leadership journey. Someone that you can talk to, someone that's going to make sure that you're eating well and taking good care of yourself. We are called to be nurturers in many spaces with our families uh, and now also at work, taking care of our parents and also at work. And so make sure that you are nurtured as well. In closing, uh, but before I go on, I want to uh, uh, ask uh, Lithia, is there anything you want to say about those calls to Black women? I need to do them for myself. I saw a statement the other day that says that um, being firm about self-care can be um, can be cathartic, can be life changing. It can also be an act of like um, revolution. Right. This idea of I should matter. I should take care of myself. And I also like the idea of us not only putting the onus 
on ourselves, right? As women of color, hey, we've got to do all this really hard work and we've got to take care of ourselves. But employers have a role to play in this as well. And so just reminding employers like, we should care for our staff and we should care for their well-being, their mental health, and we should ensure that they feel just as comfortable taking time off as they do coming into the office. And so um, those are the thoughts that came to mind to me as we, as you were reading those off, Charlene. Thank Great. you. In closing, we could talk to you all day about this, but there are Black women whose work has resulted in changes in the child welfare system. I am proud of the changes that Lithia and I have been blessed to be able to be a part of in the child welfare system. But guess what? It doesn't end with us. You can do it too. And just like Lithia and I and the women of the past that are presented on this slide, like Carrie Steele Logan, born into an enslaved family and was concerned about children being displaced from their parents. So she founded the first Black orphanage. Or Janie Porter Barrett, she was an educator and pioneer in welfare work who founded the Virginia Industrial School for Colored Girls for young Black girls that were incarcerated. Frederica Douglas Sprague Perry formed the Missouri State Association of Colored Girls. And in 1934, she helped founded the Colored Big Sister Home for Girls, which provided much needed child welfare services to girls in the area. Actually, the home existed until 1943 when the government began to provide child welfare services that included black children. And if you wonder if she was related to the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass, you are right. She was his granddaughter. You've got Dorothy Pittman Hughes, born in 1938, a social welfare advocate, feminist, and African-American activist. Uh, when she was 10 years old, her father was beaten and left for dead, a crime they attributed to the Ku Klux Klan members. So she devoted her life to activism. She co-founded the New York City Agency for Child Development, providing child welfare services, education services, and juvenile justice services. And everybody knows Marion Wright Edelman. No stranger to social workers, no strangers to child welfare. She graduated from Yale Law School and became the first woman to be admitted to the Mississippi Bar in 1964. Of course, she established Head Start and also founded the Children's Defense Forum, eventually persuading Congress to completely overhaul foster care, support adoption, and improve child care. There's space for you in this history as well. So while we talked a lot about the challenges, we also want to know you can do it and be a leader and contribute to changes in the system as well. Wow. Lahia and Sherilyn, I want to thank you so much for your time. This was great. I really appreciate you both sharing your leadership journeys and providing a true behind the scenes look at what it looks like to advance professionally as a Black woman. Um, this concludes our session. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Good afternoon, everyone. Brina Williams here. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a young adult consultant for the Capacity Building Center for States. I hope you've all been enjoying today's exciting sessions. We just wanted to take a few moments to remind you all of the center's leadership tool. If you haven't downloaded it already, the tool is a fillable PDF and includes a leadership self-assessment, space, space to take notes during the sessions, and reflection questions for post-conference discussion. As you participate in today's workshops, use the worksheet to take notes about your strengths, challenges, and opportunities related to transformational leadership. Reflecting on my leadership style, I see myself as a servant leader. I center my lived experience and the lived experiences of others in all the work that I do, as I have just as much to learn from those I serve as they do from me. I hope to use my lived experience to develop other emerging leaders and advocates passionate about helping people and changing things. Hey there, it's Wawana again. Like Brina, I am definitely a servant leader as well, who believes in rolling up my sleeves and working alongside those I am leading. I am also a leader who seeks to gain the insight or input of others on my team because I realize I don't know everything and others have valuable thoughts and ideas too. The feedback from my team informs the decisions I make. However, 
I am not afraid to use more authority and make an executive decision when needed. Because ultimately, I want to do what is best for my organization and to further the mission to help those we serve. I believe my leadership style may differ from others because I allow those I'm leading to step up and use their personal strengths and expertise to fill in my skill and knowledge gaps. I want to hear from the variety of voices around the table, so to speak, not just my own when making important decisions. Also, I'm not afraid to mentor someone else to take my position one day because seamless succession should be the goal where your team or organization can still stand and move forward should you leave or move into a different role. Thank you for hanging out and learning with us thus far. Enjoy the rest of the expo. 